our university president, Robert Nelson. I'm supposed to welcome you, and you are welcome here. But I wish you weren't here. But I hope that you being here today will make this university a stronger place where we don't have to face what we're facing right now. As you know, multiple swastikas were found on our campus and just outside of our campus. Hateful, mind-boggling, wrong, anti-Semitic, standing for everything that this university does not stand for, one of which had language about white supremacy. So, we decided we have to be reactive and to react so that we don't let this just go. But we also decided we have to be proactive and make sure that we are working actively to rid our country, our university, our region, of anti-Semitism and of white hatred, white supremacy. So today we'll have three panels. One that will talk about how anti-Semitism is rooted in white supremacy. Another panel that'll talk about healing and getting through and coming out the other side. And a final panel that will be about what do we do next? Because we can't not do something next. We have to. I am incredibly grateful for the faculty at this university. We made a very deliberate decision that the faculty would run this town hall because we need the message of love, unity, peace. The message is against anti-Semitism in our classrooms and our faculty control those classrooms. So to the panelists, thank you for coming today. Thank you for being part of this. Help us, help us to heal, help us to be strong. And everyone knows, normally I do, Sac State's number one. Stingers up, right? Not today. Today is a time to be a little bit more solemn and to realize the gravity of this moment and to make sure that we stay together as a Hornet family. So thank you to everyone for being here. I look forward to what I'm going to learn and what we will all learn. Thank you, President Nelson. And welcome again, and thank you for joining us. We are at a critical juncture, a crucial moment, when the voices of anti-Semitism and racism are ubiquitous and becoming more and more vocal. Those are the voices that have appeared through the Nazi swastikas drawn in and around campus and beyond. The most recent desecration of our space was found in our ar arboretum in the form of a Nazi swastika accompanied by the words white pride nationwide.
We know that we reside in only one such moment of escalating hate. There have been many others. Today happens to be the 84th anniversary of Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. This is a day when the Nazis went into Jewish neighborhoods, destroying 267 synagogues, 7,000 Jewish businesses, and more murdering over 600 people. This is a day that lies heavy within the Jewish communal memory. It is a day when the Jews in Europe realized, once again, that they weren't secure in a society that they treasured. So what do we do in these moments when the voices of hate are ascendant and our suffering is so great? Viktor Frankl, a psychiatrist and survivor of the Nazi concentration camps, had an answer. He wrote, forces beyond our control can take away everything you possess except one thing, your freedom to choose how you will respond to the situation. This town hall brings together a team of educators, students, community leaders, and administrators. It is an honor to have a role in making our camper a safer, more unified, and more inclusive place. By creating a safer and more inclusive space, our goal is to develop the communal skills that help us understand and attend to the needs of others. We have been given a platform to frame a campus discussion, and we want to thank you all for being here to help us achieve this goal. We have constructed today's town hall through three panels, computer, computer awareness, collective healing, and collaborative action. We wanted to be intentional about how we move from a place of reaction to a place of action. To do this, we need to first build awareness, awareness of the pain and needs of targeted groups. Second, we can then use our understanding, education, and sensitivity to come to a place of healing. And finally, it is only once we have built these capacities that we can do the hard work of action. The other part of these panel titles Communal, collective, collaborative reflects our focus on the needed joint effort of everyone sitting here. To this end, we have done our best to use the 50 questions we gathered from your registrations to form our moderator questions. The work we're doing here is not easy, and there will be growing pains but with the support of many in the university and in partnership with the larger Sacramento community, this town hall is our launching pad for future campus action and engagement. In fact, as we worked, as Sac State worked to put today's town hall together, we spoke with a number of community partners, and I would like to thank and acknowledge Bruce Palmer of the Jewish Federation and Sharon Ragoff of the Jewish Community Relations Council for their engagement. Both came to campus after the first swastikas were found and have remained engaged with the university since. We appreciate the whole community's support. As an educator on this campus, I know that we are a community with a large capacity to do this work with, encourage, with courage and fortitude. We see this every day working with the students, the staff, and the faculty. This is hard work and we will experience growing pains. We are a community with many diverse needs and experience. One of our goals today is to figure out how to attend to all of those needs with sensitivity and unity of purpose. Like I said, this work is hard, and it's hard because we sometimes compete before listening and react before understanding. Thank you. Now, before I introduce the first panel, I wanted to just let you know that there are cards on your seats if you're in the audience. I know we have a lot of members in our webinar. Um, so at the end of panel two, 
you can write down questions and pass them along. Okay, so now let me introduce our first panel. Um, in order, Dr. Kengo Akiyama. Professor Rita Cameron, wedding. So I will say that again. Sorry. I'll wait till Kengo sits. <laughs> Dr. Kengo Akiyama. Professor Rita Cameron Wedding. Rabbi Nancy Wexler. And Morgan Beatty. And I will do that again. Um, Rabbi Nancy Wexler and Morgan Beatty. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so this panel is our awareness panel. And the intention here is that we want to make each other aware, sensitive, and educated about the needs of the other communities that reside among us, to know what diversity is and how we react to these moments of hate. Um, so we are looking here on this panel to represent a student voice, the student experience, the campus experience, and then gain knowledge from those who have personal experience with these moments and our leading communities that have a long list of experience with these moments. So I'm gonna ask by asking um, Morgan, Morgan Beatty, to enlighten us or discuss the student experience at moments like this. And what is your sense, Morgan, of how students understand racism and <clears throat> anti-Semitism? I definitely think that students are scared and feeling very unsafe. For many students, this institution is a safe space, so I think when things like this happen, um, they start to question if they are safe here. And um, with the question regarding um, racism and anti-Semitism, I definitely think that students understand what racism is because of AB 1460 and the requirement of ethnic studies. So many students have an idea of what um, racism is and how it affects them and how it impacts the institution, but with anti-Semitism, I think that there's a lack of knowledge about that. And I think that um, it's really important to educate students on how this persists in the institution, even if it doesn't directly impact them. Thank you, Morgan. So your understanding is, or your sense is, that students have a, a growing knowledge of racism, but anti-Semitism isn't something they've engaged with. Um, so I'm going to turn to uh, Dr. Kengo Akiyama, um, who actually teaches our Introduction to Judaism and our um, New Testament courses. And Kengo, I thought you could maybe tell us a little bit about how you, what students want to know about these subjects that, we, that Morgan expressed they are not really familiar with. Yeah, thank you. Um, so first, I think when I, what I try to do is to, to highlight or just talk about what anti-Semitism is. And it's pretty easy to give a definition, right? What is anti-Semitism? And most people say um, hatred or prejudice against Jewish people. Done. The question is, why Jewish people? And why does it persist in the way uh, we see it today? And I, I'm interested in talking about and addressing sort of the root causes, right? The root categories, we might say, of why Judaism is perceived by many, right? Especially Christians. Um, uh, the way it is. So often in my New Testament course too, um, we talk about how the intra-Jewish rhetoric right, morphs, into a, I mean, morphs into something much more monstrous uh, later on in Christianity. So Christianity is often seen as a splinter movement within Judaism, right? And if you read the New Testament, there are lots of vitriolic, you know, going back and forth between Paul and other uh, figures and, and Matthew and and John characterized Jews as these backwards people, everything that's kind of wrong, right? Um, that's not Christianity. Um, and so they're trying to kind of separate themselves 
as it were, um, within this conversation. But it's fundamentally in the first century is an intra-Jewish conversation. But then later on, once Gentiles enter into the fold and just kind of take a look at it, you know how when you have somebody that's close to you, like between family members, some of the, the most vicious arguments take place between those who are like each other or who are your friends? Well, that's kind of the more the historical dynamic that's in place. But say somebody who is totally outside of the family enters the scene and thinks this is a really important text and then starts to kind of download their own assumptions into it. And then you start to think, oh, this isn't just the brother that I was attacking, right? This is, there's something really profoundly wrong with these people. And then they begin to think about Judaism as a whole, right? It takes this really profound role in Western tradition of all things that we're trying to get away from. And so um, I worked through these texts um, and the dynamics early on to say that Judaism becomes this idea, right, that's often um, pitted against Christianity, right, as something that you move away from or that you progress from. And so there's this repeated rhetoric, um, especially within, within you know, uh, early Christianity, um, where they attack Jews in this really con concerted ways. And I think there's vestiges of that that gets repeated easily, right, over uh, a long period of time. So, um, yeah, so I think I, I try to give students why it's so easy for Jews to be singled out in many ways because um, so much of Western tradition grows out of Christian thought or Christianity, right, the Enlightenment itself as well. And because the Jews were portrayed early on and repeatedly as the archetype of what's wrong, right, with those who reject Christians or the like, Christian truths, um, that dynamic, even if they don't quite say it that way, uh, gets carried over. And it's an easy way for the Westerners in many ways to just, when, when they want to express hate, it's an easy thing to just latch on to, I think. So I'm gonna just follow up really quickly. So how do students react when they get this information for the first time? Um, <clears throat> There's some resistance, I think, especially among Christian students, perhaps, right? Because if um, a good question is like this that I receive is, why didn't the Jews believe in Jesus? Like, that's a question that I get sometimes in class. I mean, there's so many assumptions to that, that statement, but I can see exactly where they're coming from. Um, but I think there's a lot of undoing of certain assumptions about um, especially Christianity, I think, that uh, we have to do. And I think students are often challenged, I think, because these are really dear categories, right, for them. They're, these are dear stories and the ways that they've been taught. So, um, but anti-Semitism, it doesn't, it doesn't take people who really hate individual Jews, right? But it takes a certain kind of thinking, a repetition of, certain stereotypes, right, to help prop up a certain kind of, of truth um, in one religion and, or other. So I think the, what I encounter, generally speaking, first is incomprehension. Is why would, why, why would people hate Jewish people? Like, I don't, you know, I have nothing to, I don't, I don't know anybody who's um, like anti-Semitic or something is, is what I would generally encounter. But then when we tease out some of these assumptions and the frameworks that we work with, I think that helps them to see oh, it's much more deeply embedded in the way we conceptualize than just talking about individual Jews, but you know, this group of people belonging to this backwards archetype, as it were, so. Great, thank you, Kendo. Um, so it's really interesting when you're in academia and you're in a religious studies department because we're scholars and we teach, right? But our students also will benefit from the knowledge that communities have. And so, um, Rabbi Wexler, my question for you is, so what do you as a rabbi, you know, because I think we need to know this as a community, what do, what do you as a rabbi and your community face on a daily basis in regard to anti-Semitism? So I don't know how many of you who are not Jewish uh, go to church, and I don't know how many of you or mosques where you have to have a guard or an armed guard? Uh, we do. And um, 
we, when, our, when we have children on site for our religious school, we have to have a, a guard there. We have a, a big fence around our property. You can't get into the property unless you're let in because of our fear of a shooter. We have invested in a bulletproof or shatterproof glass throughout our building because of shooters. We have had our building on a, on a um, Kristallnacht years ago, we had um, our building defaced. Uh, many of you may know, I don't know, in 1991, there were three synagogues that were torched, um, some worse than others, but in one night, um, somebody came, two men came and um, torched our sanctuary. We're all crawling out from the rock of COVID, trying to get our community to come back together. At the same time, my community fears coming together. They are aware that um, what happened at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh on a Saturday when Jews were coming to just pray and to study a sacred text being shot. This is something that doesn't stop. Just last week in Chico, uh, a synagogue was defaced. This is something that is meant to inspire fear, I think. Um, and yet, you know, we are a resilient group. <laughs> and we don't teach, we, we teach joy and we teach connection. Um, we do a lot of work in the interfaith community I'm a member of Salam Shalom, a sisterhood of Muslim and Jewish women. My 10th graders visit different houses of worship and they will be visiting us. So we have fear, but we're also persistent in continuing uh, to be joyful, to live our Jewish faith, to be involved with social justice and to um, connect with churches and mosques and Buddhist temples so that we are part of the fabric of good values of spirit. Thank you. Um, so this makes me think, um, Professor Cameron Wedding, you and I have had these conversations and I know you are very engaged in, anti in bias training. And so these, these themes of courage and fear and resilience, um, I think are very applicable to the work you do. And based on some of the conversations we've had, uh, my question for you is, what are you most concerned about with in this moment of escalating hate? And how might this relate to our students' experience and the ways our own institution and other institutions work? Thank you for that question. Um, I am here this evening after having given this a great deal of thought and consideration, I, I don't think in my career, I've been on this campus for over 30 years, professor in, in women's studies, ethnic studies, so I, I teach in two of the disciplines that have been considered the most controversial disciplines in the academy. <clears throat> in the last couple of years, particularly since I watched the murder of a black man in broad daylight in American City by a police officer, I think that changed me forever. I have been teaching judges for 15 years. I taught judges all over the country. I was teaching them at a time when you couldn't even utter race out loud. I couldn't say, I'm here to talk to you about race or racism because they would not have stayed. After the George Floyd murder, we saw, and all of you saw, that there is an escalation. All of a sudden, people around the world were protesting against the um, injustices and racial um, discrimination. And people wanted to make sure that you know, they had a voice in that that we had acknowledgments from all over the place. We had the American Medical Association that talked about that the race, racism is a public health issue. We had 
um, organizations like the, the Kansas City Star, media organizations that were offering their um, apologies for their commission and omission that contributed to racism and resulted or you know, helped facilitate issues like, like Jim Crow and redlining and housing and all the other forms of discrimination that black people and other groups have experienced. But that only lasted a second. I think it was like a split second. It, most of us were very hopeful. We thought, this is the moment. We're gonna change, America is going to change. And I do a lot of work in other parts of the world. And I always say to people, <clears throat> I'm gonna tell you about my America. I don't want you to get the wrong impression. I don't want you to think that I don't love America be but I, because I love my country but I know my country can do better. So I thought it was that moment, that point in time, that we were going to show that we could do better. But that moment has passed. It's all but forgotten. The conversation about you know, race has now shifted back to more polite terms like diversity and equity. Not to say that those things aren't important, but what I'm saying here today, and I think what my students need to hear, and what I think we all need to hear is, let's tell the truth about structural racism. Let's have these conversations with each other so I can learn more about the cultures of other people so I can be more supportive and be allies to them and vice versa. But we're never going to get there if my colleagues, for example, and people who I've heard say to me, People, white people who I've heard say, you know, I'm not affected by racism. That's what I heard the other day from, um, in a group I was working with. A white person said, well, you know, it's not my thing. I'm not that passionate about it. And what I want to say to them is, you're affected by racism every day. But as a beneficiary, you have been taught not to think about it. So that's what I want my students to understand, and that's what I want you to understand. And I also, in closing, want to say this. Before watching what we saw in 2020, I was always very circumspect in terms of what I said in a group like this. And now I'm even more circumspect because I think that the, the costs for talking about these issues in public have gone up. And there's not a day that goes by that I don't think twice about what I say in public. But I, I have to respect the fact that people trusted my voice to bring me here and that I have to tell the truth about what I think and what I believe. That's what I think my students need to know. Yeah, that's great, thank you. Um, so some of what you said, Rita, just to explain, we see this panel as awareness, which is part education. It's making us all aware of what the people who are targeted experience. The other thing we realize about those experiences, and I think you touched on it, um, Rita, that is that how do we, I mean, when we are a targeted community, how do we take that, how do we in those moments of, pa of pain attend to the suffering of others, right? Do we, how do we, because one of the things we're facing is Oh, that happened to them. That's something you, I feel like you express. I don't, right? So, so how do we attend to each other um, in those moments? And, and that's for our whole panel, but um, yeah, please. I just want to comment on how you started mm -hmm. and how you um, fully, you know, you spoke of the indigenous people that used to be here. You would not have done that 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. The fact that you started today acknowledging who used to be here mm -hmm. shows me and should show all of us that we do have the ability to change our behavior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree. So Morgan, um, I'm going to put you on the spot now. <laughs> um, so one of the, on this whole level, right, if we're thinking about our campus and our students, um, so when acts of hate occur, as what we've seen around campus, how do you think, 
students attend to each other's needs. You know, you mentioned that um, briefly, like sometimes people say, oh, that happened to this group, so um, it doesn't really affect me. And that's what we've kind of been talking about on this panel. And I think um, sometimes on this campus, it feels a little siloed with certain marginalized groups. And I, and I believe that as, as a community institution that we should come together and um, really listen to each other's needs because um, we all experience oppression and it might look differently, but it, it's still oppression and no one's, no one's pain should go unseen. And I often feel like that happens. So I think um, it's important to come together as a community, um, starting with students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so I'm thinking we're, we're getting ready to wrap up. Um, so I'm, I'm going to look at the panel. And oh, Kango, sorry. And I was, I, I, that's what I was going to ask for any follow, any more comments. Sorry. Yeah, and I really like how Rita kind of connected to, um, you know, anti-Semitism. There's a lot of parallel between, I mean, white supremacy or anti-blackness and anti-Semitism in many ways. And I think one of the points I wanted to make, but I didn't, um, is that I think anti-Semitism is not a problem for the Jews, but it's actually a problem that we all participate in, right? Especially for Christians and and those who um, benefit from essentially othering the Jews. And I think the incomprehension kind of tells me in many ways that, you know, it's, it's, it's actually, it affects all of us in many ways um, because again, if Western civilization came out of Christianity, then all this benefits by definition benefits all of us, right? Whether through its benefits or, or, or oppression. So I think what I wanted to say is that this particular othering technique, it's very similar to other forms of oppression. And I think one of the keys in towards healing is first to recognize that, oh, I am connected to it somehow. You know, it's because, well, I'm not Jewish, so therefore, you know, it's got nothing to do with me, or I don't hate Jews, but to think about it at the systemic level. And I think that's precisely uh, a point where thinking about this and racism together is quite fruitful. Yeah. Rabbi Wessler, <laughs> can I? Yeah, I just I think, think that when we other people, we're, tonight, we're talking about anti-Semitism, but we're really talking about the othering of other people. And um, I really would love to have a further conversation with you, Professor, about anti-Semitism and its origin. Um, but it's true, if any of us on this campus, any of you on this campus are othered, it's just the beginning of the othering, and it is, um, it's so important that we call it out and that we name it. Um, I, I was told by uh, Dr. Nelson that next week we're gonna be doing something here about um, sexual harassment on this campus. Every time we call it out, every time we stand up to it, we're gonna make this a much better and safer place for all the students to, to thrive and to grow. Yeah. And what you're see what I think we're we're doing is is um, I think Kango you mentioned the healing portion, right? And what I'm what I didn't mention is what we hope is that the voice that the voices here when we switch over into our next panel um, will still be resonant in the next panel. We couldn't sit us all down, or we could, but we were trying to get these three themes together. And so the the voices you're hearing here will come up again and again. And we will walk off this stage in a minute or so, and we will transition to our next panel. Um, and at the end, three members of this panel and three members of the second panel will come together in a final discussion to kind of mimic what we're talking about, the idea that we're building community. Right? There is a very diverse, group of people on this stage today, um, both on, on many levels, right? Professionally, um, ethnically, racially, religiously. Um, but we're coming together and, you know, we are looking to help the students and the faculty here to, um, to come together and be, be unified. And I'll say this now and I'll say it later. We're hoping that when you, when you and we step away from this room, that we take it with us and it lingers 
And we're, when we interact with other people on campus, we take our, we all have so many needs, we take those and listen to the, the needs of others. So now we're gonna transition into our next panel, um, which will be moderated by Michael Nguyen. So um, thank you everybody. Good evening, community. I am Michael Van Nguyen, the Associate Vice President of Inclusive Excellence. It is an honor and with much great gratitude that I present our next group of panelists. First, we have Professor Greg Kimju, who's part of our Department of Psychology and is a cross-cultural psychologist. Next, we have Professor Luis Garcia, followed by Dr. Ann Kemtrup, And lastly, Rabbi Mona Alfie. So as you heard from our last panel, there was quite a bit of awareness in us helping us understand our different communities, how they're impacted, the hurt, the harm, and the trauma that's experienced. So the purpose of us putting together this panel is to discuss the ways each and every one of our practitioners, scholars, community leaders, and activists, and faith healers, how they help communities that they support and are part of heal. So I'd like to start off, you heard quite a bit of what our community awareness panel mentioned. If you could help, if you could share how you help the communities you support and are a part of process and heal from the experience that experiences that we heard from the prior panel, as well as those that experience acts of hate, such as the ones that have occurred on the on and around this campus. So if we could have Rabbi Alfie, if you could start us off. So I think it's important to understand that part of the healing process is being seen and acknowledged. Um, and, and I wanna go back to the, some of the comments for the first, camp, uh, first panel. One of the things that I think most non-Jews don't understand is that anti-Semitism is, is not just about someone's religion. It's not about their faith. It's about hating someone inherently for who they are. The majority of Jews are born Jewish. It's not necessarily a belief system. Most of the Jews I'm related to don't actually do a whole lot that's Jewish. Um, you, from a religious perspective, you're not born Christian. You have to accept the faith. You have to believe there, there's a whole system based on your belief system. I was born Jewish. I could do nothing for the rest of my life and I am always gonna be ethnically Jewish. And as a Jewish person, you grow up knowing that it doesn't matter what you do, it doesn't matter what you say, there are people who hate the fact that you exist in the world. The swastika is not a religious symbol. It's a symbol of hate that came from a government that was a secular, a secular government. Um, and, and I think it's important for non-Jews to understand that the, the way Jews see ourselves or understands what it means to be Jewish is this is our ethnicity. For many, it's our faith. Um, it is our family. It is, it is something simply of who I am. Um, 
if you take a DNA test and you're Christian, it's not going to show up on your DNA test. It doesn't say, oh, you're 25% Christian. Um, if you're Jewish, it shows up on your DNA test because that is our ethnicity. And I think that that's important for people to understand. Um, and a lot of times, um, when I have Jewish students who deal with stuff on campus, or when our synagogue was, um, so Nancy, 1999. So, so in 1999, Rabbi Wexler's congregation, my congregation, the Orthodox congregation were torched. And it wasn't because what we taught, it wasn't because of what we believed, it's because we existed. The other two targets of those same um, people, those brothers, they murdered a gay couple because they existed. They torched a um, Planned Parenthood um, clinic because part of a lot of what we see with white supremacy is misogyny, is a huge part of their ideology. Um, and in order for healing to, to occur, there has to be understanding of who you are. So one of the things in our congregation, or in our community, um, and both Rabbi Wexler and I are part of this with Anne, part of the healing process is about getting to know people. And so I'm gonna give uh, an example that Anne was a part of in terms of a healing process um, for our community. After the Tree of Life murders, um, the Jews of Sacramento, well, all Jews were really freaked out about the idea that you could just be sitting in your sanctuary praying on a Shabbat morning and be gunned down. Um, but for, I think for those of us in Sacramento, it was particularly unnerving because we knew what it was like to have our synagogues attacked. Um, the next morning, the very next morning, the Muslim sisters in, um, in chapter one, um, our chapter of Salam Shalom, sister of Salam Shalom, came without being asked to our synagogue and they patrolled it. And they basically said, we stand in solidarity with you. You are suffering. We see your suffering. We're not going to wait for you to say this is what we need. We're just going to hold out our arms and we're going to be there for you. Um, and I know for me personally and for my congregation, that was, that was so important because we felt seen, we felt understood. Um, and that I think is a huge part of the healing process is just to know that somebody can sit with you in your suffering and just hold you. Wonderful, thank you so much for sharing. And Professor Garcia, as an art educator, I know that you help folks interact with diverse communities, mm -hmm. learn from them, develop culturally relevant ways for them to engage with art so that they feel welcomed, valued in artistic and learning spaces. Can you please share how you do this and ways in what helps communities heal? Absolutely. Um, so prior uh, to me coming to Sacramento State, I was an art teacher at my former high school in Los Angeles for 14 years. And so, Part of my development as an educator required me to constantly reflect uh, and take action on my own reflection, right? From lesson planning to the way that I engage with students to the way that I engaged with parents uh, and eventually to the ways in which I engaged in those communities, right? Because little by little I started engaging with families and students outside of the classroom setting. And I began to understand, despite me growing up in the same community, not only did I understand that community, the, the community's social dynamics, right, as a student myself, but I understood it as an educator, right, uh, 15 years later. I understood it as an educator. And so I started diving into critical pedagogy, right, the idea of and drawing on the social political experiences of students to develop their social consciousness for their own social transformation. Uh, I started diving into critical race theory in education that acknowledges issues of race, class, and gender, right? Uh, and, and acknowledges the racism, um, sexism, and classism that have existed, uh, you know, it, it, throughout different 
historical perspectives. Um, and so one of the things that I've developed was this way of welcoming the knowledges that students bring into the classroom, right? We're in positions of privilege, right, as educators, as administrators, as whatever profession that we have. We have a position of privilege, right, and we need to recognize it. And in terms of healing, I don't think that ever happens, right, because we can, we can process what, what, what we've experienced in our communities, and we can find ways of navigating by understanding how historic forms of racism have impacted communities today and how they're going to continue impacting future generations. Because if we look at our um, populations that are mostly incarcerated, the highest percentage of those populations are um, Latino and brown communities. And so how, how is that going to impact future generations? Right? And so one of the things that I do, right, again, I use art as a tool, right, but I also welcome the knowledge that students bring into the classroom right, by pushing and acknowledging my privilege that I'm not the holder of knowledge, I'm not the sole holder of knowledge, right, and I welcome the knowledge that communities bring into my classroom, right, and it's been, it's been a great adjustment for me here because now the students that come into my classroom are much more diverse, right, and much more diverse because when I was teaching in a marginalized community, I mostly taught Latino and black students, right? But now I get to learn more about students, other ethnic groups, um, and, and they use it to learn about the elements of art, the principles of design, right? And I'm not using the traditional approach to education that is often ethnocentric, right? Um, and based on those subjects that we teach, Right? This, is, this is what I recommend that we all do. Recognize our privileges right? as, as we see ourselves as the holders of knowledge, but we do not hold all the knowledge. Right? Welcome the knowledge that our students bring into our classrooms or to our learning spaces and use that to develop their knowledge about the subjects that we're trying to teach them. Great, I appreciate you sharing. Dr. Kemptrup. You have a long history of service, community action, ranging from being a board member, doing interfaith work, being an epidemiologist, veterinarian, parliamentarian, among many other things. Can you share with us some of the ways you support communities in healing? Um, sure, and I'll, um, I'll do this in two stories to reflect that broadness that you're talking about. Um, I'm going to start with the Sacramento Area League of Associated Muslims or Salem Islamic Center in Sacramento, which I've um, raised my family in. It's a very important Islamic community in the area. Several years ago, uh, mosques throughout, um, throughout the United States, actually in California and our area too, were receiving hate notes and threat notes. Um, at Salem, we received flowers and love notes and calls and people from the community coming to us and saying, we're so sorry, apologizing for others. What can we do? And, and, and we were kind of stumped, you know. <laughs> what can you do? But oh my gosh, I mean, what a feeling of support. So, so why did that happen? Uh, you know, aside from being in this wonderful community of Sacramento, why did they come to Salem and do that? And that is actually because at Salem, our, um, our mission from the very beginning has been to build an American Muslim identity. The Muslim part is very important. It's really important to build your identity, to raise your kids in that, to give them that. But the American part is about reaching out and building bridges. And that's something that we have done from the very beginning. So right away, 
um, the community who, who knows us, you know, right away came to heal us. So my point there is that this is a, one example of how you have to be, to, to heal, you have to be proactive and build those bridges. Um, the second story I'm going to give is really the origin story of the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom, which began over 12 years ago with the founder, Cheryl Olitsky, who's Jewish and who went to Poland and who was shocked and dismayed to see all the um, anti-Semitic, Islamophobic rhetoric that was just so profound at that time. And, and she was shocked and hurt. And she came back to the U.S. and realized the same thing is going on here. You have that white supremacy movement that's pushing this theme. And so she said, you know, let's bring Muslim women together. And there's a reason for women, and we can talk about that in a, in a, in a different way. Women do things a certain way. And through other introductions, and she did not know any Muslims herself. That's the other thing. And so she, through other introductions, met Atia Aftab, who's a Muslim lawyer on the East Coast. And together, they brought together their friends. And that organization then that they eventually found goes beyond just sharing about our religious commonalities. But they share being religious minorities who are persecuted in this co uh, country. So by being together, you are actually having a strength of being together and countering a lot of that divisive messaging, you know, um, the othering, the anti-Semitism or the Islamophobia. There is a great tendency to want to retreat to your corner where it's safe, and then you divide. So what Sisterhood of Salam Shalom does is bring people together. And so it counters that device of messaging, and it also, um, I mean, it, there was clearly a need because the organization grew very, very quickly, and now there's 2,000 members across the United States. And here in Sacramento, we actually have six chapters and about 100 women together. And so um, what, what we do, and, and, and we support each other in times of crisis, as um, Rabbi Monai mentioned, um, but we're all, it's a proactive healing, if you will. And um, so we, we, to heal is, is not a passive process. To heal is a, um, is a proactive process. And so building bridges and making those connections ahead of time is what is, what is going to build that resiliency and healing. Professor Medju, as a cross-cultural or as a cultural psychologist, you have a unique right, psychological lens on how you approach and help communities heal. And I know you've done that in the community as a practitioner in certain respects, but also there's, these are things that you also teach in the classroom. Can you share with us a bit on, on some of the work that you've done? Uh, sure, so thank you for the question. Um, I'd like to uh, address it uh, by talking about the individual and then the group or the communities that, that we work with. And so um, at the individual level, uh, so I'm a culture psychologist and I teach courses on uh, cross-culture psychology and then also uh, multiculturalism, uh, looking at race, discrimination, prejudice. Uh, and in the class and with my work, we focus, of course, on the individual. And I think it's important to understand that uh, as human beings, we're, we're imperfect. We have a lot of biases. Uh, and uh, as some people would um, uh, state that we, naturally form some of these uh, in groups and then lead, then we have these biases. But I, I think those may be some uh, tendencies that we see, but that's also an excuse for prejudice, for discrimination, because we also have a great deal of agency. And when we see moments of injustice, we can act, we can do certain things. And uh, in that sense, as we mature cognitively, emotionally, psychologically, uh, we need to be uh, proactive and we need to heal ourselves when we notice those biases that we may have and think, oh, we have this epiphany and think, uh, I didn't realize that I had those views. And so we try to educate ourselves and then uh, try to change 
uh, our uh, views and then our actions. But I, I also think um, uh, healing at the community level is very important. So at the individual level, we can share our experiences and our voices and our lived experiences and all of those are important, but we need to have community and understand that our experiences are not in isolation and that through our connections with other people and through uh, having these types of discussions, and that's why, that's why I'm very thankful that we uh, have uh, this uh, forum today, uh, this town meeting, and we're able to, as a collective, be able to have these discussions. And it's not comfortable. It's, we experience a lot of discomfort. I think when we talk about healing, it seems kind of this linear process where ultimately everything is okay, but it's not. There's gonna be a lot of discomfort in my classroom. Students experience a lot of discomfort, but I think it's important to experience that discomfort because out of that discomfort, then we have growth and we, we can begin to better understand uh, the different experiences that, that all of us have. Okay, thank you. So as we've heard, there are numerous ways that you know, our different panelists have addressed healing. So we have being seen, heard, acknowledged, right? And building bridges through art, critical pedagogy, and then also looking at psychological aspects from an individual and a group level. So now I'd like to open up to the panel on how might we learn from each other to collectively heal. And also we heard also the first panel talk about within group versus across group. How might we take our ways of healing to, to help within and across group? Um, uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, the, the theory that grounds the sisterhood in bringing uh, diverse groups together. Um, and one of this is based on Gordon Alport's theory on contact theory. So when we, yeah, you, you nod knowingly, and, and we actually very intentionally use that theory to bring us together, and that's um, based on equal status, so you're coming together um, all at an equal level. You have common goals, um, you know, we're countering hate, building bridges. Um, you have intergroup cooperation, so we have projects. We have a Sadaka Sadaka day, it's the same word for a charity in, in Hebrew and Arabic. And, and we do in September, a very, or December, a very active project. So we work together on that. So there's no competition. Um, and then you support the authorities and laws of each other. So, um, so for, we come together and, and we eat, but we, we just make it vegetarian. So we don't have to worry about, um, and we do like to eat. Uh, we don't have to worry about dietary restrictions. So, but if you do that very intentionally, and, it, and, and it's that intentionality of coming together in that you're going to be able to, to make some of those. And um, I'd like to hear more about being uncomfortable because that's really important too. <laughs> um, I, I'd just like to add that uh, I think an important skill, an important value is being an ally uh, to each other. And we don't necessarily have to have the same experiences, but if we are in community, that just a simple word, are you okay? If you see something, try to act. That those words and actions go an incredibly long way. And you know, more than people know. And being that ally, and again, we can have different experiences. We don't have to have the same experiences. Being that ally uh, creates that greater sense of community. And we can kind of move towards uh, race, uh, healing as a community and uh, address a lot of these problems. Yes, Rabbi Alfie. So you asked how do we heal collectively? And I think that the only way to get to the collective is by first focusing on the individual. And that one of the su successful things about the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom is that we begin, when I think of Muslims, I think first of the people who are in my life who are Muslim. And it helps you counter stereotypes. It helps you counter things that you've been taught about like the collective group because it's no longer Muslims, it's, but it's Anne. <laughs> it's Anne's family. You know, that's her mosque, that's her community, that, and it becomes personal. 
and that when you start building those personal relationships, it affects the way you see an entire group. It hopefully affects the way you engage with that group. Um, and I want to I want to build on what Anne said. I think it would be amazing to be able to have here on campus um, something like the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom, but not just for Jews and Muslims, but for small affinity groups that are intentionally diverse. Um, and one of the things that we do is before we get to the uncomfortable, which is really critical, before we get to the comfortable, uh, un uh, the uncomfortable, we spend a year getting to know each other as people, as human beings, what are your fears, what are your concerns, what stresses you out about being a mom or a wife or this or that, before we brought up the uncomfortable. Because then by the time we got to the uncomfortable, I can hear, I could listen, I could pay attention because I'm gonna be less defensive. Um, and I think it's really important, we don't do enough to see people as people. And once we really develop those one-on-one -on -one relationships, we begin to re-examine our own biases. Yes, can I add to that? Um, thank you. Um, you. You know, just to kind of uh, re reiterate what, what a lot of uh, the panelists are saying, right? One, one of the things that I wanted to mention was this development of trust, right, with engagement with diverse communities, with diverse students, uh, with diverse populations in our communities is trust, right? It is the foundational component to uh, develop relationships, to develop support, um, to develop approaches to education that are productive, right? Because sometimes we're teaching certain, uh, certain contexts, certain perspectives, and when we're not in the classroom space, it, it stays in the classroom space. Um, so part of that, right, of working outside of the community with students is, and, and I'll give you the example of the Believe mural that was just uh, finished not too long ago here on campus. Uh, one of the things that I talked with students about was recognizing and talking about our own histories, right, because it's part of their own identities. Right, and I asked students, have you seen any reference to your identities or historical identities here on campus? And for the most part, they said no, right? Uh, and so that was, that was the idea that, that I submitted in terms of a civil rights leader's wall uh, that referenced the ethnic groups and histories of the students in, in my classroom. Um, the idea of believe, right? Uh, the theme of belief was, was the theme of the murals. And one of the things that I mentioned students said, would you rather hear me tell you belief in the English language that we're talking about, or would you rather hear the word believe uh, in your home language, right? And so for that reason, right, you have a diverse uh, representation of civil rights leaders from different ethnic groups and from different parts of the country. Uh, and throughout the mural, you see the word belief in the home language of the students that, that, um, that participated in, in making uh, the mural. Um, so just wanted to add that as well. Great, I appreciate you sharing. So this concludes our second panel and I'd like to have this panel stay here before we invite our panelists and to invite them back up for the third, we have, I'd like to welcome, it's my pleasure to welcome Mayor Steinberg, who will be joining us via the Zoom stage. Thank you, I just had to unmute. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having me. Um, I'm really, I didn't know about this forum until earlier today, but I'm just so grateful um, to the Sacramento State community, President Nelson, uh, the faculty, the students, for uh, holding this very, very important forum. Uh, because above all else, what I know and what I believe as mayor of the city and as someone who has um, 
experienced far too many chapters of our diverse communities in Sacramento being subject to discrimination and hate is that the most important thing we can do in addition to holding perpetrators accountable for hateful acts, the most important thing we can do is to speak up, speak out and support each other. In my 30 plus years uh, in this community in various uh, titled and untitled uh, positions of leadership, we have suffered um, some extraordinary hardships as a community and as uh, diverse peoples. Whether it's um, the hate and discrimination against Sikh Americans, including the killing of uh, Sikh Americans uh, when I was in the state Senate, whether it was the, and continues to be, the discrimination against Muslim Americans, uh, especially when uh, American political rhetoric gets toxic and poisonous about immigrants and, and, and people of color, whether it's um, the bombing of the NAACP and the never-ending discrimination against African Americans, whether it's the hate crimes against uh, Asian Americans, whether it is the continuing demonization of Latino and other immigrants, uh, again, um, started at, 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 on a national political stage by divisive politicians, whether it is the LGBTQ community um, who have constantly had to overcome barriers to progress. Um, the two, the one of the most insidious and original forms of hatred, the reemergence of virulent anti-Semitism on college campuses um, and throughout uh, our community and throughout our country. Who could believe that we uh, would have to consistently see the visualization of the swastika in public and private places um, adjacent to or on our most uh, cherished college campuses? Who would think that, that, um, that famous pop singers would brazenly uh, spout poison anti-Semitism. Who would think that a N star NBA player with millions of followers would uh, tout a film that denies the Holocaust? These are things that are happening currently in our world. And the for a forum like this is crucial because if we don't have the honest conversations about prejudice and about the importance of not being selective around standing with each other. We can't be strategic in one sense of the word and decide that we're gonna stand with one diverse community because um, we may uh, or not stand with them because we have we may have other differences on foreign policy or any other issue. We have to be consistent, consistent in saying to each other, the Jew to the Muslim, the Muslim to the Jew, the African American to the Latino, and the Latina to the African American that we are going to stand with each other whenever any of us is threatened with hate or discrimination. No compromise and no exception. And I worry a little bit, in fact, I worry more than a little bit about the division among some of our diversity elements in a way that gives more power, frankly, and more sway and say 
to the haters of all of us. And I think that's the honest conversation that needs to be had. Because it's easy for me or anyone, and I know I had to join late, and that what I heard of the panel is very, very impressive, to simply say that we all need to stand with each other and for each other. But it's a lot harder when Jews and Muslims may disagree on the issues in the Middle East, if that leads to some of our diverse elements not standing with Jewish students on campus because um, they may have a different opinion on the Middle East. That can't be. We have to support each other around what binds us, which is that the hater hates all of us. And the hater will come after any of us um, if they see that opportunity. And so college campuses are supposed to be places where the free expression of ideas um, is not only accepted, it is, it is embraced and celebrated. And I think it's never been more important than to really, really listen to each other, especially amongst each other. The old idea of preaching to the converted, we should no longer take for granted because we may all be converted, but it doesn't mean that we are supporting each other in the way that we all should. Hate is hate is hate. Discrimination is discrimination and it's discrimination. Exclusion from any club or group based on one's point of view is exclusion, is exclusion, is exclusion. So I'm just grateful because no one should feel alone uh, and everyone should feel protected uh, by that common value that no one is going to be allowed to denigrate someone else or exclude someone else because of who they are. Um, you know, um, the world is both broken and the world is fabulous and capable of incredible progress. I often tell the story when I started in the legislature 25 years ago, it was controversial, highly controversial, not for me, but for many in the legislature to consider voting for domestic partner protections for LGBTQ couples, even whether a spouse should have the right to visit their loved one in the hospital based upon their domestic partner status or whether that was going too far. 25 years later, barely a generation, we now have marriage equality in our country. And if that doesn't show all of us what we are capable of doing and changing together, if we really work together as opposed to divide among ourselves, then I don't know what a better example there is. But change is possible, and we can overwhelm the haters so long as we don't even unintentionally hate each other. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Mayor Steinberg. At this point, if for those that have written down questions on the index card, if you could pass it down, we have staff support coming around to gather them. And now I'd like to invite back our moderator, Professor Stark, as well as Professor Cameron Wedding and Rabbi Wexler to join us for discussion in collaborative action. So as you've heard, many on our campus and community most certainly appreciate the important piece of us 
denouncing acts of hate and then also removing the symbols. But a big part of why this panel was brought together was to have us work together in how we could move forward, be proactive. Proactive bridges, bridge building, I believe is what you mentioned, right, Dr. So let's start off with our first question for the panel is what concrete steps would you take to help our campus move towards collaborative action? I can just share with you what I have researched and seeing other campuses and what they've done. Um, having a not on my campus uh, group, um, an anti-hate policy, but I like so much the model that was brought up by uh, Dr. Kadim and also Rabbi Alfie about really learning about who we are as individuals, if there can be a way of bringing other marginalized groups together and learning and hearing and listening and creating a, a deep uh, fabric of, of individual knowing, um, I think that that would be a good step. Dr. Kemcha. Um, and, and I'll segue on there, but um, you know, it's more that you have to have a curiosity to do that, but you also have to have a bravery because um, a lot of times when you come and you're bringing a disparate group, a uh, Muslim coming to a Jewish group, there's always these whispers in the Muslim community, in the Jewish community, and sometimes the biggest enemy you face is in your own community. Why are you going to them? And we've heard that from both sides. I have a co-leader and she gets it and I get it. And um, this is what I tell all my sisters and what I would tell anybody is, um, you know, to come together in a group like where there's disparate person, whether it's going to be learning about a different race, whether it's going to a, a culture or religion, um, is that um, you are really being a peacemaker. And it's, it's much more productive. I mean, I, I love the um, enthusiasm and the energy on college campuses as people are learning and becoming aware of their issues and what's important to them, and they're going to protest and be activists. It, being an activist and raising a sign is almost passive in comparison to having to come together. And that's radical peacemaking, is when you come together and you put, you're, you're, you're risking, you're standing in your own community, you're facing the other, and that's bravery to me. So people who do that, whether it be in the Jewish Muslim context, whether it be in, in, in different races or socioeconomic or things like that. So it's building these intentional groups. Those are people I really admire, are people who do that. Rabbi Alfie. So I'm a little hesitant to speak in part because of my own ignorance. I'm not sure what you guys do on campus already. But it might be wonderful if there was a course that students had to take towards the beginning of their coming to, to Sac State, whether it's as freshmen or as a part of an orientation program, where it's about how to learn about other people, how to ask questions, how to express curiosity, how to try to understand people of different groups. And, um, and then how do you use the, I, th I think it's an important skill on how to be a learner. You know, it's about learning how to be curious and to go a step outside your comfort zone. And so maybe there could be a course for students to take, because for a lot of students, I assume that come to Sac State, They've been in a very homogeneous community, you know, whatever their high school was or their hometown, and this may be the first time they're really engaging with people from other ethnic, cultural, and religious groups. And this could be a wonderful opportunity for them to learn how to do that, how to get over their own discomfort, and how to engage. Yeah. Dr. Garcia. Absolutely. Um, I just wanted to jump on that opportunity uh, to mention that one of the reasons that a one of the things that attracted me to Sac State was uh, 
the Anchor University initiative that you know I stumbled upon when I researched community engagement at Sac State. Um, and so part of that has sort of propelled me to bring back a course that had not been taught in over 10 years, which is Art 148, Barrio Art and Communities. Uh, and, and it was originally established by former uh, professors here at Sac State, but they were part of a artist collective known as the Royal Chicano Air Force. And the purpose of Barrio Art, the course, was, was to engage students in the communities of Sacramento, right? Um, in short, one of the things that I constantly believed in and learned through my experience as an educator was that the most influential experience a student will have is not from what they read academically. Uh, it's from the engagement that they have with the communities in and outside of you know, their, their learning space. And so in this case, uh, I partnered up, uh, I partnered the course uh, with Washington Elementary. Uh, and so they opened their doors because the principal was a former Barrio Arts student, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Sac State alumni. But when I brought, you know, the opportunity, you know, with me to, when, when we were having this conversation, um, she said, yes, do it here, right? And so we have Sac State students that are learning about teaching, um, getting a sense of whether they want to teach or not, right? And, and so that was what, that's the purpose of that class, right? For students to engage with communities, um, to, to challenge uh, misconceptions that they may have about the diversity that exists in this community. And, and to also, right, again, develop agency in improving not only communities similar to the ones that they grew up in, but in communities that they feel, um, that they feel need someone like themselves. So just wanted to say that we definitely have that. And, and you know, I'm sure there's other uh, service learning courses, all right, that, that provide those opportunities here. Thank you, and I think believe the professor. I just want to say that, that one of the, uh, frustrating experiences for my students is that they receive a lot of this knowledge. They, um, you know, understand the impact that these uh, types of incidents can have. Um, but it's, it can be really frustrating because they learn about it and they realize how horrible it is, but they don't know what to do. There's no action. And I would say a lot of these discussions, that's where they stop. We have these discussions. So I appreciate the question about action and what, what can we do. And for me, I shifted quite a bit uh, where I felt a great need to be out in the community and uh, to, create, to create opportunities for students to not only learn about these topics and issues, but to have action, to be an advocate, um, and uh, to be a good citizen of our communities. And so I, I have uh, been fortunate in that I've created a number of partnerships with K through 12 schools and one of the things that my students always uh, talk about is uh, I give them a number of different options about what they can do, and they, uh, they always want to focus on, on uh, K through 12 education because from their experience, those are the critical years, you know, as we know, uh, but that's where they feel that they can make the most impact. So I know the university um, highlights those types of uh, partnerships, and, and I, I just want to um, emphasize how important that being out in the community uh, being able to provide these opportunities for action, that, that's very critical, not only for the benefit of the community members, but for our students, because we're creating these pathways for them to have careers uh, doing, doing these things in the future. Um, so, and, and that goes a long way to addressing uh, a lot of the problems that, that we see. And I recall during our first conversation, you also had an idea about creating some sort of allyship program on campus. Is that a correct recollection? Yeah, uh, well, one of my areas is, is actually racial trauma. And um, this incident, even though 
its focus on the Jewish communities, it affects all of us. It, it affects me. It affects minoritized groups. It affects marginalized groups. It should affect all of us. And we have this negative experience, but it's also an opportunity. Uh, we talk about, about uh, post-growth, uh, growth during uh, traumatic experiences, and I think this is a nice opportunity where we can demonstrate our resilience and, and our action and to come together. Again, we don't have to have the same experiences, but we can all relate in that way mm -hmm. and do and, 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 and put together a plan and, and have action. Thank you, and then I believe you had your yes, hand up. Yes, yes. I think it's very important given what's happening throughout our country in our schools, the impact of critical race theory, the way it has infiltrated our schools, and even some of our college campuses in which we are, people are feeling like they can't teach about some of the issues. I mean, I've been teaching and using critical race theory in my classes at Sacramento State for 20 years, and no one has ever said, oh my God, she's teaching critical race theory. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so we know that that's a ruse. We know that's not real. It's color blindness 2.0. We need to keep this conversation on the table and we need to help people instill confidence in having these very mm -hmm. difficult conversations. And one of the ways that we can instill confidence and help people instill confidence in themselves is to help them understand their own implicit biases. Our, our unconscious biases are driving everything we do, uh, including me in terms of how I, when I look back on some of my experiences with students, I am appalled and embarrassed at some of the assumptions I've made about students who even look like me. Um, and I think that as a faculty person, we make policy decisions every day. We, make, we write policies, we enforce policies, but a policy is only as good as the person who's applying it. And so we need to create opportunities for people to have these difficult conversations and really bring it all the way back to what, what do my biases look like? How am I making a difference to, with my students in the classroom? How am I judging them differently? How am I assuming that this student is smarter than this student because this student, um, this student who sags their pants couldn't possibly be as smart as this student who looks a certain particular way? So I think we really have to be very intentional about these conversations. Thank you, Dr. Cameron Wedding. Earlier you mentioned the term, Dr. Kemchuk, radical peacemaking. If you could help us a bit more on something a bit more concrete, right? Let's say this is something we want to do here at Stack State and, and in our community. Can you give us a bit more? Yeah, and um, I love that term, and I, I, I came up with it because I did realize how, how scary it is sometimes to sit, sit at the table. There is um, there's a new book out by Ibu, Ibu Patel, who is a uh, writer in interfaith, and it's called We Have to Build, or it's time to, bu it's time to Build, I think. And he's talking about it is, it's now time, this time now is, is to build these kind of um, either organizations or classes or opportunities to intentionally come together and, and, and do exactly that, to, to, um, to be willing to be open and vulnerable and say who you are and, um, and, and, and be curious and learn about the other. But it, it, it does have to come with parameters. Um, so whether you do it in a kind of class, um, you know, as for incoming freshmen, you know, where you teach them these kind of dialogue skills, it's basically skills and dialogue. Um, I think that's really important uh, because then you can come together. I think, you know, um, some of these things, um, these acts that we have seen um, may or may not have been actually, you know, they're, a lot of times they're from the outside and they're from the outside trying to divide the inside. And so if you have the skills to say, I mean, I, I, I will give it a specific example. In a, when uh, there was um, the, um, in, in Israel and Palestine about a year ago, 
a year and a half ago, there was an escalation of tensions as homes were being taken away. And, and um, we were getting calls on both sides, uh, my co-leader and I, and we said, we have to have an emergency meeting. So it was the last day of Ramadan, and we brought our chapter together. And again, because we had developed those skills, we could sit down and say, what are our fears? And that's the first thing that really, people are afraid, you're afraid, so you're gonna either lash out or you're gonna hide. But if you are together and you know each other, it's great comfort to be able to say, I am with somebody who represents the other. On the other hand, I can also tell them what I'm afraid of. And from that, we came up with concrete actions. We wrote letters. We got um, our broader sisterhood involved. I think I went to one of your meetings. <laughs> so, I mean, everybody got involved. And it's because we built those foundations. So, you know, I think this idea of dialogue and learning how, uh, how to talk to the other, mm -hmm. um, I think, is, is really important. Professor Garcia, I have a, a question for you. I, what happened on the campus, in and around campus, but I'm particularly thinking of the, the most recent, which is the swastika and the words white pride nationwide in our arboretum. This is, I, I call this a desecration of our space because any communal space is sacred. Mm -hmm. right? And so I'm wondering, how, the, the question is how do we reclaim our space, right, from this hatred, from this vitriol? And, my question is, art seems like such a powerful way to do that. And I just wanted to, because I feel like that's what you do in your work. Right, right. So I'm going to answer this in a way where it might not be the answer you're expecting. <laughs> but for this reason, right, this is the, the way that I use art as a tool um, for social consciousness, for social transformation. One of the things that I automatically thought is, okay, how do we reclaim this space? And, and to me, my, my teacher light came on, right? Because not only am I thinking about this as an art teacher, but I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about what if I was a teacher within, you know, from another, like, that focused on another subject, right? And I, and I constantly teach art through an ethnic studies perspective, right? I use art to show students art techniques, elements of art, but I use historical examples of racism for them to investigate these techniques. Mm -hmm. So what I thought about, right, in terms of your question, how do we reclaim this space? I think the question we should ask is, how do we stop that from happening again? Because as, as it was mentioned, maybe it was someone that wasn't part of the Sac State community, right? Maybe it was someone that came from the outside and just desecrated, you know, part of Sac State. But again, what, what does it take, right? And this is why it's important for us to support this ethnic studies campaign, right? Not only across California, but across our nation. Because if our K through 12 experiences are the most critical, right? And we're focusing on teaching to the test, which is about, you know, standardized testing is how well did you capture what, you know, what we teach, right? And for the most part, this history or this education is not focused on the communities, right, that we have in our classrooms. So if we were to teach about the diversity of different ethnic groups and the historical forms of racism that have affected, you know, all our communities, then we would have the compassion, right, as we grow and develop as students, we would have the compassion of understanding the shared struggle that exists within marginalized communities. And as a collective, then, as it is, has been mentioned repeatedly, then we can heal together. Now, whoever, whoever wrote that, if they would have had ethnic studies classes, 
you know, either through their elementary and middle school and high school, would they have done that if that was the case? Mm -hmm. Right, so yeah. I wanted to share what I initially instinctively thought, right? But of course, then there's projects like I mentioned, right, where we can collectively come together to understand in each other, learn from each other. Uh, and, you know, and I've done this through, through different examples here on campus as well. I just want to pick up on that thought of uh, how do we spark curiosity in one another instead of othering the other, mm -hmm. right? And if we have curiosity, it changes the whole conversation. Right. Yeah. Mona? I'm gonna add a little problem to that because I love what you're talking about. And I realized as I was listening to you, the one little problem is that in our country we have what I like to call the generic American. Um, for those of us who come from an identity and an ethnic group where we have a sense of who we are, mm -hmm. what you're talking about is fabulous. But often these white supremacists are coming from, if you, if you were to ask them, where are your people from? They have no idea. And I think it's that lack of sense of self mm -hmm. that sometimes attracts those people to the white pride movement because they haven't, it's an emptiness. Mm -hmm. you know. And I think that there's such a need, a human need to know where do you come from? What is my family's story? And if you aren't raised with that, you're gonna fill that vacuum and oftentimes fill that vacuum with something that could be toxic. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how, how do we get everybody? How, how do we help those people who might be vulnerable to, to that ideology of whiteness or that identity of whiteness as opposed to a cultural identity? How do we help them have a sense of self that they can be proud of without putting down other groups? Because so much of that white pride identity mm -hmm is really about putting other people down because they don't have a place where they stand. I don't have an answer, uh, um, yeah. but I just think that has to be part of, yeah. part of it. I actually think that part of the problem is whiteness is their identity. Right. And having privilege yeah. in this country and throughout the world mm -hmm. is their identity. And I agree, it's extremely toxic and extremely problematic. At this point, we'd like to turn to some of the audience questions that were posed and you know, feel free, this is open to all of our panelists. So the first is from Sunny, a community member that works for the California State Senate. Sunny has heard a quote, we are not pro-Palestinian, we are not pro-Israeli, we are pro-peace. What paths can we take at Sac State and at UC Davis, et cetera, to work on this concept? I'll, yes. I'll answer that. Um, uh, so, um, so I think um, part of the um, issue, and it kind of comes down to what I mentioned before. I mean, it is building your own identity, right? But um, if your identity is related to one part of um, a conflict like that, then, um, then you're kind of stuck. And, and you're not gonna be able to get out of that. And um, I think it's really important that you know, we, f we recognize first, you know, we're part of this country. What's going right here? First of all, always start from a positive perspective. I'm a forever Pollyanna, but that's usually what I start from. <laughs> and that helps me open up to think about other things too, instead of just, you know, hanging on to negative thoughts. So, you know, what's going right here? Well, in Sacramento, we have this incredible diversity, whether it's integrated or whatever, it's a different thing, but we have the, we have the people, the resources here, right? So, um, so, so on UC, at, at UC Davis campus, and, and to some extent here at Sac State, I'm aware too, it's, it's really easy to, to fall into these camps. I am this, I am that. Um, and then to get your activism on, which you know, it's kind of an awareness building 
Um, but really, um, you know, once it's like you can sit there and push for your side to win, but then suddenly you win, then what? So if you haven't built those foundations of, of, of building, of communicating, then, um, then you're not going to be able to, I mean, your winning will be meaningless. So, um, so I'm going to get back to um, uh, my, my hero, Ibu Patel, who is <laughs> one of my heroes. And uh, he does have an organization, um, I think it's called Interfaith America, and it's specifically for college campuses. And it's um, something that you can use to build, to bring, and I think it is important, like for example, specifically in the Muslim Jewish realm, to bring Christians into the conversation, to bring everybody into the conversation, because everybody actually has a role in that area, um, then, um, then to learn how to come together as equals and have those conversations. And they have to be more than one-time conversations. There has to be, because you know, one and done is fine, but then you're not, you know, you're not going to be continually connected with it. So whether it be a class or whether it be something, the other thing that's challenging on campuses is the turnover. People are here for two to four years, so it is hard to make those longer-term connections. So I mean, if there is some kind of something we can funnel them into that's required to, you know, every year have some kind of dialogue, facilitation, something like that that teaches them some skills and hopefully sparks curiosity. Curiosity is so key in all of this, you're right, uh, Rabbi Nancy. So um, that's how I would look at it. I mean, I have reached out to uh, folks at UC Davis um, and encouraged them to participate in the interface specifically for that. My other thing is if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So <laughs> that's why you have to be there. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Rabbi Alfie, did you? I feel like you No, had, I, you I have nothing to add to what Anne said. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great. Another audience member, this is from Ethan, a history student at Sac State. How have the recent comments of celebrities like Kanye West about the supposed Jewish elite, in quotes, affected the public perception of Jewish people? What fuels anti-Semitism? I want to acknowledge the courage in this room, and I want to acknowledge the courage of corporations that have stood up and you know, severed ties. It's calling it out. It's saying it's not tolerable. We will even have you know, Adidas and financial loss because we're, we refuse to uh, be a bystander. I'm noticing upstanding uh, values showing up. And I think that it's so blatantly ugly, uh, what he says, that I, I, I'm seeing courage uh, standing up. So I'm feeling supported, actually. So I have a, a slightly, just slightly different perspective. I think that Kanye should have been dropped by all those people when he was making anti-African American <laughs> statements. Mm -hmm when he said slavery was a choice. Why wasn't he dropped then? Mm -hmm. um, why wasn't there a public outcry then? And I think that there's a danger when we don't, he should have been called out then. And then I don't think we would have made it to the most recent statements if, if we just call it as we see it. And I don't think there's enough accountability um, for what people say. And I think that there was maybe a fear of people to. Like maybe someone like me would have said, oh, I, I, I don't want to speak for another community or something like that. But I should have said, that's not OK. You know, that's, that is hurtful. Um, and so I think that for me, what his recent statements really highlighted is, why are we letting things get to the point where it has to be so outrageous that we then say stop? And has our tolerance for BS mm -hmm. just gotten so high that we, we don't stop it. And then one last question in the interest of time here from the audience is, people with hatred in their hearts have existed forever. Now they, 
they, are, they seem emboldened to openly show their hate. They also hold highly visible positions in government, businesses, etc. How do we counter the agendas of those in power? First, you should vote. <laughs> and then you should vote again. And then you vote again. And I think that that's one, to do, one way to do it. Um, I was terrified going into last night. I was so prepared to be devastated and to be scared and to be crushed. Um, was it all the way that I wanted? No, but it was really nice to see that maybe there were, there were enough people who were held accountable for what they said to give me hope. And so if we wanna hold people accountable, vote with your ballot, vote with your pocketbook, and vote with your feet. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think sometimes it can feel overwhelming because it's so high. Um, but I think it's also really important to remember that um, any small little thing you do is amplified. And I think you talked about that on the individual interactions that you have with people um, is really important. And even if you start small, those actually all have ripple effects. So I think you start by saying, how do I want to be? Um, and, and if you want to change, if you want to be curiosity, then you start curious, then you start with yourself. And that has a ripple effect. And uh, whether it is starting a new organization or um, reaching out to somebody you haven't done. And, and um, you know, you, and then again, start also of what's going on right around me. I mean, you're here, you're here. I liked your comment to, comment to applaud people who are here. That's going right. So there is a difference being made. And you can do more. That concludes our <laughs> final panel. We'd like to thank you, our panelists, for devoting their valuable time and sharing their knowledge and experience in moving us forward. So if we could give a... Thank you. So with this gift of knowledge and experience in moving it, us forward, it is our responsibility to take what they have gifted us to collaboratively act. One way we will do this is by calling you in to this work alongside us. So towards the end of our closing, you can start by responding. A tiny URL will be displayed on the screen, which will ask three things. First, to indicate your interest in the ideas that were presented by our panelists on collaborative action. Next, to share an idea or opportunity that was not presented, that you believe that we should consider to help our campus move forward. And last, to provide reflections on the town hall. So now I'd like to pass the mic over now to Professor Scott. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so doing this over the past three weeks, I've really learned how strong we are as a community at Sac State. And I know, because I now, I've only been here eight years, some of the other faculty would laugh at me. Oh really, that's not a lot. Um, but in the eight years I've been here, I know that we have the capacity and the strength to do this work. And if we're successful and really successful, we've provided a platform and a type of engagement that can be an example for our campus, but can be an example for other campuses in our area and beyond, because everybody's trying to do this. Not everybody, but a lot of people are trying to do this, and I think we are providing that platform, and I know that the, our different partners, whether it's the community, or it's the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, the President's Office, the faculty, the students, are all engaged with this, right? And so I know that we have the strength as a community, right? So as we end this town hall, it's not the end of our journey together, but rather the beginning. 
we'd like, to, we'd like you to not just leave this space, but linger in this moment. We hope that you come away from this town hall with a sense of how to better attend to your own needs as well as be cognizant of the needs of others. This idea of the individual and the people who are right in front of you at that time, when you step out of this door, attend to your, uh, your needs, but also then listen and understand. And so I'll end, I always like to end a moment that's not my words because there are many people's words that resonate for us. So I just wanted to end this moment in time with the words of Gloria Anzaldúa. And she says, what we say and what we do ultimately comes back to us. So let us own our responsibility, place it in our hands, and carry it with dignity and strength. Thank you, everybody.